spelling? My name is Chip Grote, G-R-O-A-T. I'm Associate Director of the Energy Institute and a faculty member in the Jackson School of Geosciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Well, the most important underlying scope of this study is fact from fiction. The resource is so important to the United States and to the globe that if there are legitimate concerns about the impacts on the environment of producing, transporting this important resource, we need to understand that. And in today's world of communication rich uh, environment, we've had many, many, many claims and concerns expressed by the media, by individuals, by non-governmental groups and by neighborhood associations about what hydraulic fracturing may be doing to their landscape, to their property, to their water. And given that vast concern, it was very important to determine how much of that concern is based in fact and how much of that concern is really based in just concern without any documentation. So consistent with the Energy Institute's interest in, in bringing science to bear on, on important issues, policy issues, environmental issues, we assemble the team of Capable, pe capable people from across the university because sorting facts from fiction requires an interdisciplinary approach. So in the very beginning, it was important to look from the communication school point of view at what has been claimed in the media, the written press, the visual press, the social media, uh, and, and the verbal at meetings and so forth. And so that was an important part of our study. So we assembled the body of concern about the study about the concern, <laughs> better go back on that. We assembled the body of information about the concerns that have been expressed. Once concerns are expressed, then the question is, have they been investigated? Have they been studied? Have they resulted in any actions or violations? So we really had to understand what the regulatory framework was for the carrying on of shale gas development and particularly hydraulic fracturing. So we employed an attorney uh, Hannah Wiseman, who was with the University of Tulsa Law School, is currently with Florida State University, to look at the regulatory framework in the Barnett Shale in Texas, the Haynesville Shale in Louisiana, and the Marcellus Shale in the Northeast to see what the states are enforcing regarding the development of, of shale gas and, and ultimately, in some cases, shale oil. And what's been the result of these investigations? What has actually happened that resulted in some cause for concern expressed through a violation? So that was an important part. But then if there is a violation, what is the cause? The initial hysteria and really flagrant concern that was expressed by people was that this hydraulic fracturing at a few thousand feet beneath the surface was causing pollution of groundwater and may have even triggered seismic events and resulting in emissions of, of methane into the atmosphere. So what really did happen is important, but what caused it is important. Was it hydraulic fracturing? Was it something else? So this review of the regulatory framework and the violation record was extremely important in associating not only fact with claims, but what the fact demonstrate actually caused the concern. Well, the next step there really has to be what, what is the environment in which this is occurring? What scientific research has been done into those concerns? Has there been investigations, gather facts, analyze data, make interpretations? So we employed an environmental scientist from the Bureau of Economic Geology to look at the scientific literature. And finally, if you're going to put all this together in some format and you're addressing good policy from good science, you have to communicate it in such a way that policymakers understand the science. So we employed a person who's very skilled in decision support systems and graphics to assemble our information, assemble our findings in forms that are effectively communicated to policymakers, and that was Dr. Suzanne Pierce from the Jackson School. And as a way of making sure that we're on a level road and that we're not being oriented in any particular direction, we have had an association with the uh, Environmental Defense Fund group. They're an environmental, very responsible environmental, non-governmental organization that's interested and concerned about environmental effects of shale gas development, but most importantly, they're interested in the facts. So they have been along with us in this study. They've been reviewing our reports, reviewing results, making sure that issues that are out there are brought to our attention and that we deal with them in this uh, interdisciplinary way that we've set out to do that. So it's been a very interesting study, and it's been uh, overwhelming in some regards, uh, particularly regarding the amount of information that is available in the state regulatory agencies that has to be sorted through and interpreted and, and attributed to various aspects of shale gas development. I think it's important for people to understand that in many ways shale gas development is not much different from conventional oil and gas development. A well is drilled, a well is cased to protect shallow groundwater, 
Uh, tubing is put in the well to produce the fluids. Waste fluids are produced and disposed of. Produced salty water is, uh, comes up the well bore in later stages of production and has to be disposed of. There are surface pits to hold salt water. There are surface pits to hold drill cuttings. All of this happens in both conventional and in shale gas development. And so we wanted to be sure that what we were seeing is, was directly related to a shale gas development process that many people think is very different and therefore has its unique concerns and one that is much like in many ways conventional oil and gas development because it has its own set of concerns which may or may not coincide with those with shale gas. So that's been an important direction for our study. Talk a little bit if you would about some of the findings you uh, reached preliminarily with, with your report, specifically if you would at first about uh, some of the issues associated with surface water. Let me start in talking about findings with what the assumption was going into the study, and that was that many people assumed that shale gas fracturing, hydraulic fracturing, was polluting groundwater and was causing bad things from those fluids getting into groundwater. Perhaps the most uh, overreaching study, that, uh, conclu let me start that over again. The immediate concern with shale gas development and hydraulic fracturing was that fracturing at several thousand feet below the surface would put chemicals into groundwater that people drank that would be very bad for your health. And so people were very much opposed to hydraulic fracturing from that point of view. So an important part of our study was to determine whether or not there is any direct verified evidence that hydraulic fracturing itself was producing contaminated waters that ended up in that process in groundwater. Our preliminary finding is we have found no demonstrated uh, evidence that that demonstration that that has happened. Uh, now that doesn't mean that there aren't ways for fracture fluids or produced waters or flowback waters to get into groundwater supplies and that brings us closer to the surface than where hydraulic fracturing takes place. So we see those pits at the surface, we see well casings that perhaps were not properly prepared, we see leaks at the surface or trucks that roll over that can put fluids from the process into surface water and into groundwater. And in fact, most of the violations that have been recorded in the state regulatory agencies have been at or near the surface and have been related to the handling of produced waters, the handling of flowback waters, the handling of the chemicals that go into hydraulic fracturing, not hydraulic fracturing itself. So does that mean there's no problem? No, of course not. There are problems and they're, they're documented and they need to be dealt with by the industry. But hydraulic fracturing itself does not seem to be the culprit in any evidence that we found. Do you make in your report, or will you make in your final report, any recommendations regarding the need for tougher, more stringent regulations and or better enforcement of existing regulations? The regulatory record is an interesting one in hydraulic fracturing, and that is that the regulations that are being used in most cases are the ones that have been used for years. They have not been custom designed to hydraulic fracturing. Does that mean they're not good enough or not adequate? And we don't find any clear evidence that that's the problem. If there is an issue, it's the frequency of inspections, the, the workforce available to do the inspections and surveillance. And, and the obvious happens. If you go to a well site, you see at the surface. So it's not surprising that we see mostly surface violations. And many of those are procedural for didn't put a sign up on a, on a fence. Uh, a, a mud pit leaked or something like that. Again, not that they're insignificant, but they are surface effects, not subsurface effects. I think if we had any recommendations, it would be that more attention needs to be paid to what actually happens in the groundwater body. There needs to be more sampling of groundwater. There needs to more, be more analysis of things that you don't see because that's harder and is more involved and many of the regulatory staffs aren't equipped to do that. So we would encourage better monitoring of, of the groundwater as these processes take place, regardless of what source of contamination might be, and more baseline studies. We're finding in many, if not most places, what the water was like before oil and gas development took place is not recorded. So how do you know whether you've had an effect or not, or whether the effect that has happened is due to the causes that you're involved with or that somebody else is involved in? So number one, more baseline information prior to development. Number two, uh, more stringent methods for sampling and analyzing subsurface information, particularly groundwater. And number three, uh, a better capability to uh, attribute the actual causes of, of problems to the actual effects so that when we inform the policymakers to in, enforce the regulations or enhance the regulations, that they deal with the right, the right issues. We examined the three principal areas that were involved at the time we started. That is the Barnett Shale in Texas, which has been going on for decades, 
the Haynesville Shale in, in Louisiana, which is a very large play and very active one, and the Marcellus Shale in Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, parts of West Virginia, which is a developing play. And the geology is significantly different, uh, ranging from the Marcellus to the Haynesville and the Barnett, whereas the Marcellus Shale development takes place in shale formations that are shallower and more apt to be connected to groundwater supplies and may have nat natural methane in them already, therefore a, a, a confusing factor in some cases as to whether hydraulic fracturing is putting any methane in there or not. And on the other end of the spectrum is the Barnett and, and even the Haynesville where the depth of, of the currents of the shale gas is such that there's no connection and no methane in the shallow groundwaters that could have come from natural causes. So if you're going to understand baseline conditions and their importance, you need to be sure you understand them in different geologic settings, not just in any one particular place. Okay. At the uh, AAAS meeting in Vancouver in February, we will present the results of our study more than the preliminary findings we're at a position to discuss now. And we'll focus on water effects and we'll focus on the record of concerns, the record of actual claims, and, and the record of violations and concerns, and how they relate to what has actually happened. In other words, separating facts from fiction. We'll also say a little bit about some of the other issues that have been raised. There's the question of seismic activity, and I think other panelists will address that more completely than we will. But we'll point out how differing geology and different processes could involve seismic activity as opposed to it being only fracturing. It could be injection wells, and there's some evidence of that, and I'm sure that'll be discussed at the meeting. There's been growing concern about fugitive air emissions. Does hydraulic fracturing result in the release of methane, which is a much more serious, short-term at least, greenhouse gas and carbon dioxide, into the atmosphere? And if so, are we causing more problems just from those fugitive emissions uh, than we might have thought originally? And there is some concern about that, and there's some concern that compressors and transportation systems need to be looked at more closely to minimize those fugitive emissions. So we'll deal with media beyond this, the groundwater, but we'll only do it by reference. And so you will be delivering a, a final version of your report at, at a news briefing at the, the AAAS meeting? At the AAAS meeting, we will have a news briefing which will present the results of our study and be available for questions about them. And they will be uh, specific to the three areas and they'll be specific to the actual uh, causes of the concerns that have been documented.